I'm Professor of Psychosocial Studies at the Thomas Coram Research Unit, which is in the UCL Social Research Institute, and I'm going to chair the meeting. Just um, a quick reiteration of Zoom rules. As usual, as I'm sure we're all used to now, microphones off, please, unless you're speaking. And when it comes to um, discussion later, if you could raise your digital hand, that would be really helpful. We'd love to hear from you. But first of all, we're going to contextualize the book by having two 10 minute presentations and then Patricia herself speaking for 15 minutes. And then we'll open the microphones to you for comments and questions, which we'd love to hear. I'm going to introduce each of the speakers on the panel briefly now in the order in which they'll speak. Our three speakers together can all be seen as helping to shift understandings of motherhood, parenting and families. So our first speaker will be Charlotte Faircloth and she's Associate Professor of Social Science in the UCL Social Research Institute in the Thomas Coram Research Unit where I also am. And her research focuses on parenting, gender and reproduction and she uses qualitative and cross-cultural methodologies from sociological and anthropological viewpoints. She's explored infant feeding, couple relationships, intergenerational relations, and currently she's doing a very innovative study jointly on the impact of, of coronavirus on family life internationally. Her collaboratively written book, Parenting Culture Studies, was a gender setting. It explored in detail the ways in which deterministic thinking about the impact of parents on their children's futures had implications for parents and for the professionalization of determinist approaches. Her work on attachment parenting is of direct relevance to our subject matter today. After Charlotte, Tracy Reynolds will speak. Tracy is Professor of Social Sciences and Director of the Centre for Applied Social Sociology Research at the University of Greenwich. And she's also the School Director of Research and Enterprise. Over the last 20 years, Tracy has established an international reputation for groundbreaking research on transnational and migrant families. She's looked at constructions of motherhood and parenting and racialized and gendered identities, and has an extensive research and publications portfolio on, on work done in the UK, in the Caribbean, and in North America. Her very first book, published in 2005, called Caribbean Mothers, Identity and Experience in the UK, was a landmark text that showed how she deconstructed the term mother showing how it, the treating it as homogeneous, the term mother that is, served to render the mundane, gendered experiences, practices and positioning of black mothers invisible. And at the same time, to maintain stereotypical and pathological views of black mothers. Since then, her research has continued to pioneer work on motherhood, families, racialization, migration, and other groups that are under-researched. Patricia Hamilton is the reason that we've come together today. She's a Marie Curie Research Fellow in the Thomas Coram Research Unit in the Social Research Institute at UCL as well. And her current project is an intersectional examination of parental leave policies in the UK. And she's focusing particularly on policy changes since the 1970s from the perspectives of black parents. Patricia's taught in South Africa and Canada, and she's presented her work in various countries, including Ireland, the UK, the USA, and Canada. Today, we're celebrating the publication of her book, Black Mothers and Attachment Parenting, a Black Feminist Analysis of Intensive Mothering in Britain and Canada. And it was published in December last year. So first of all, Charlotte, can I invite you to say at something for 10 minutes. Absolutely, and thank you for a lovely introduction to all of us there, Anne. 
Um, so I was first introduced to Patricia in 2012, I was looking back over my emails, um, when she was completing her MA in Gender Studies um, at the Uni uh, University of Sussex. And she got in touch with me via the Centre for Parenting Culture Studies in Kent, asking for reading uh, recommendations for her dissertation. At the time, I was just um, completing my own uh, research about attachment or sort of natural parenting um, based on research uh, with mothers in the UK and France. So the timing was perfect. It was you know, lovely to meet someone else who was interested in the same subject. So Patricia wrote, I'm currently an MA gender studies student. I'm originally from South Africa and I'm very interested in pursuing a PhD at the end of my master's. Since the birth of my nephew in 2005, I've been interested in what I like to call baby politics, how and why parents choose a natural birth, co-sleeping, exclusive and extended breastfeeding, cloth nappies or elimination communication, baby wearing, delayed vaccinations, home or unschooling, something a lot of us are familiar with, <laughs> albeit not by choice back now, um, routine infant circumcision, et cetera, et cetera. I'm particularly interested in how class influences these decisions. Around the time of my nephew's birth, I joined a few online parenting forums and was interested to discover a desire to return to nature among mostly middle class women. The idea that one should give birth naturally, for example, because our ancestors had done it um, and because women in developing parts of the world still did it. And so it was natural is also interesting um, and was quite popular among forum commentators. How this intersects with race is particularly interesting to me, especially as breastfeeding, for example, is more popular among black and poorer women in South Africa, while the opposite appears to be true in England. So what a joy it is to see this book, which I actually have um, in print uh, in my hands, um, the, the product of that promised PhD and those initial thoughts you know, actually out in the world. Uh, during her postdoctoral studies, uh, sorry, during her doctoral studies at the University of Western Ontario in Canada, and then with a stint at the University of Bristol, and then as a lecturer at Stellenbosch University, uh, University, and finally, I'm very happy to say, as the holder of a highly prestigious Marie Curie uh, Fellowship, Patricia has worked exceptionally hard, often in exceptionally challenging circumstances, to bring this book to fruition. I think anybody who managed to, to produce anything in 2020 should feel particularly proud of themselves. Now, I know that both Patricia and Tracy will say more about the book itself, so I don't want to sort of uh, repeat too much uh, here. But what I will say is that it is a really necessary addition uh, and a beautifully written one at that to the field of uh, parenting culture studies that Anne uh, spoke about earlier, in that it develops an intersectional analysis of contemporary mothering, and in particular because it draws on black feminist theorising. So scholarship within parenting culture studies has mainly looked at the kind of historical change uh, in the way we understand the process of raising children, uh, specifically within the last 50 years or so, so sort of since the 1970s, I suppose. And largely that's been concerned with what's been called an intensification of the, the duties of child rearing. So drawing attention to uh, particular parenting behaviours to demonstrate a heightened, uh, the, the heightened responsibilities and significance assigned to parents who, based on a neurological developmental rationale, are increasingly understood to have a critical uh, and sort of lifelong uh, effect on, on how children turn out. And as such, parenting has been kind of uh, reconceived as both the source of and the solution to a whole host of social issues. Based largely on work in Euro-American context, such an intensification uh, is sort of inherently tied into a, a, a neoliberal rationality, where the goal of economic growth uh, could be said to reinscribe um, values of self-discipline and responsibility uh, as markers of good citizenship. So these notions of good citizenship are therefore inseparable from good parenting, uh, both in how parents demonstrate this good citizenship through their child rearing practices and in the production of good citizens um, that this parenting is meant to facilitate. So to this end, both scholars within and outside of parenting culture studies have, have sort of aptly demonstrated how gender um, and class constitute these ideals of good citizenship and, and parenting in particular. And there's plenty of people in this room um, who have, have done that. Um, but in, in particular, um, it sort of highlights the, the concentration on maternal behavior 
um, and the use of middle class parenting behaviours to define the norms of good parenting. So in some ways that could be seen as just talking about sort of torn middle class mothers who are sort of you know torn between the worlds of work and home but actually it's more than that. Um, the problem here uh, is the way that intensive parenting is the one that has become culturally uh, validated, meaning that the vast majority of parents, regardless of class, will be left feeling that they fall short somehow. And as such, ideal parenting practices can be mobilised in a class-based way. Um, so Tracy Jensen's work on the politics of parent blame is really crucial here, um, showing how uh, what she calls crisis talk around parenting has been used to police and discipline families who are considered morally deficient and socially irresponsible. And more worryingly, she also shows how this has been used to justify increasingly punitive uh, state policies towards families. However, even within that sort of body of work and those kinds of concerns, there's been less attention uh, paid to how race informs the negotiation of these ideals, uh, at least until you know, Patricia's book was published. And this is where she focuses on the ways that race actually also inform these ideals of contemporary parenting and good citizenship, as we said. So as she puts it, the rise in attachment parenting's popularity reflects a racialization of good parenting and those who are unable or able to enact it. However, the point here, and I think this is what I really appreciate so much about Patricia's book, is not only to focus on the ways that dominant ideologies restrict black women's experiences, which they certainly do, but also to show the opportunities for agency and resistance something that I think this kind of long-term in-depth ethnographic uh, research really helps us grapple with in a very productive way. So as such, in this book, Patricia account, uh, presents accounts of black mothers who use attachment parenting as a form of kind of ideal parenting um, to assert themselves as good mothers who do this too, uh, with all of the class, gendered and raced implications that that entails. So the book therefore explores two really important questions. How do black mothers engage with attachment parenting? And what do those engagements tell us about attachment parenting and its inconsistent association with good mothering and the contemporary realities of black motherhood? So again, I expect Tracy will, will sort of talk more about these questions in Patricia's work, but also in relation um, to her own, but suffice to say, as, as Anne mentioned, that these kinds of questions around parenting ideals and, and race are ones developed in Patricia's more recent research project, the subject of her Marie Curie, uh, which explores the race uh, dimensions to parental leave policy in the UK, um, a subject that is of interest to many of us in the Thomas Coram Research Unit. So I'm going to wrap up now, but uh, Patricia I just wanted to say that, you know, I really feel that your scholarship is exactly what is called for in the contemporary moment. It is deeply considered, but hugely pressing. Um, I could not be more delighted to be joining you in the launch of this book and to be able to call you a colleague. We are so incredibly lucky to have you at UCL. And I have no doubt that this will be the first of many books in your academic career. So many congratulations. Thank you, Charlotte. That's wonderful. Tracy. Hello, good afternoon. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, so I, I just wanted to say, like, I remember when Patricia was thinking of doing her PhD at the very start of her academic journey, she reached out to me and I remember to, to tell me about, you know, about what she her, what she's interested in doing. I remember us sitting in the grounds of the University of Greenwich and um, just talking about her research ideas. So um, I was so thrilled to hear that she completed her PhD and even doubly thrilled to know that there's now a book um, about it. Um, and thank you, Patricia, for inviting me. Um, so what Patricia asked me to do is not so much to say much about her book because I want to leave the spotlight to Patricia to, spoke, to talk about her book, but to really just to um, contextualise um, and understand her book within the broader context of Black Mothering. Um, so um, in Anne's lovely um, welcome and introduction, um, and you know, 
as Anne said, I have been writing about um, the issue of black mothering for a number of years, um, since the 1990s. And I think I've continued to write about black mothers. And one thing which has remained unchanged over the many years is that um, black mothers operate at the intersections of race, class and gender. And this um, means that we have a different, it presents a different understanding of mothering and motherhood and also our mothering practices. So for me, black mothering signifies a political act of resistance against intersecting inequalities. And to this end, black mothers care of their children and their families is not confined to the domestic sphere of a household or the family unit. Rather, our mothering operates at the borders of the public private um, divides and boundaries. Black mothering represents a site of struggle and survival. Yet it's also a collective, connective and community space where we as black women can thrive and accomplish great acts of achievement in our individual lives, as well as those of our children. Pivotal to black mothers community engagement is their kin work. Um, this is black women, not just biological mothers, but also operating as um, cultural mothers, a term sort of um, introduced by Patricia Hill Collins, for example, and community mothers. So this also means black women who are teachers, community volunteers, healthcare workers, and so on, operating within their local neighborhoods and within community organization. And crucially, this kin work, um, which, um, which they invest in supports and nurtures black children in society and, this and tries to challenge this position um, whereby um, our children are stereotyped, pathologized and positioned as second class citizens. And now more than ever, it's important to contextualize and understand black mothers lived experiences in contemporary Britain. We are witnessing a period of political and cultural history in the UK, whereby right-wing populism and a fear of a racial other is on the rise. And just to highlight some examples of this, you know, for example, that austerity has encouraged the moral discourse around parenting, whereby those, whereby some categories and some people and some women are categorized as undeserving and the deserving poor as a result of good versus bad parenting. And um, I'll leave that question to you as to where you think black mothers sit within that. Um, this racialization of black mothers and their kin works oftentimes positions them as un undeserving and poor parents or bad parents in policy debates. And also where it's in a period where there's a number of health inequities and health inequalities. And we know, for example, black women are more likely to die in pregnancy and childbirth compared to women of other ethnicities. And the COVID-19 pandemic has really thrown a spotlight on a number of these health inequities. Um, we know that black women as mothers, we know that oftentimes they work in frontline services, they're more likely to be impacted in terms of their health, but also in terms of being health and, um, health and social care workers, we're more likely to be employed in industries whereby you're more at risk of being affected by the pandemic. We're also having to juggle homeschooling as other women also do, but there's also higher rates of unemployment for black women as well. Um, so I just wanted to say that, you know, living with living in a society where there is racial inequalities, it's not surprising then that the care and nurturing that we provide for our children as black mothers are often underpinned by deep seated fear that we are raising our children in a society that seeks to denigrate them. A central component of our mothering is therefore adapting strategies to challenge racism in our own and also our children's lives. And this includes, for example, talking to our children from a very early age about the impact of racial oppression and identity politics so that they can successfully navigate the environment and institutions that seek to place them at a disadvantage. My current research um, very much builds on this and the current research um, which I'm doing with other feminist scholars, feminist scholars such as um, professors Umut Yarel and Maggie O'Neill is very much interested in exploring the lived experiences of migrant mothers. And what's really interesting for me is that the, the majority of the mothers that we work with are black, oftentimes of West African and Caribbean descent. They, have low in, they live in low income households, and they're affected by their policy, no recourse of public funding. And what this policy means 
um, in reality is that for these women, um, they're denied basic citizenship rights in terms of accessing particular types of social welfare, benefits and healthcare. And what we're trying to do with this work and what we're really highlighting is this idea of the role of black mothers as co-producers of knowledge. So recognizing that we're the experts in terms of speaking about our own experiences and, um, and also making sure that that knowledge is validated um, and accepted as real knowledge. And what we try to do is, um, you know, what we, we engage with a number of strategies to challenge racial inequality at both individual and collective levels. So we use a lot of participatory methods. We use a lot of um, creative methods and methodologies. And through the process of sharing and documenting our individual and collective stories, it means that these women can directly intervene in public and policy discourses around black mothers and migrant mothers. And in this way, we're able to generate new knowledges that challenge the stereotypical narratives which pathologize um, these women as other deviant and a problem to society. At times, for me personally, it feels like sometimes as a black woman, as a black mother, it can feel like a futile act because we're constantly being fed the image that we are lesser than, and that we're dysfunctional, particularly when compared to white middle class um, ideas and ideals around mothering. And it's difficult to detach and disconnect from some of these negative ca characterizations and pathologizations of black family life. As a single mother to two children, including a son who's soon to be entering adolescence, I live in constant fear um, of, you know, um, something happening to him, um, either as being a, a victim or a perpetrator of crime. And for me, this is because there's this everyday underpinning inference that, for example, black men are culturally predisposed to violence and crime. And oftentimes it's a result of parenting, i.e. mothering, um, uh, mothering and family structures. And these stereotypical narratives speak to this idea about there being dysfunctionality at the core of black families and also at black mothering. So these pathologizing discourses also treat black mothers as an essentialized homogenous entity. This ignores the rich diversity of black mothers and our experiences. And while there are factors that create a commonality in experiences and collective action and our mothering, um, it's also important and I'm also mindful to highlight that one person's experiences does not represent all. And studies in the maternal need to highlight the stories from a, a diverse range of mothers. Otherwise we'll end up running the risk of perpetuating these negative discourses rather than challenging them. So my final point is just to say, this, this is why I'm really thrilled and pleased to see um, Patricia's book and to be invited to the book launch because, you know, Patricia's um, book again brings another dimension and highlights the rich diversity um, of black women's lives. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tracy. And now I'd like to invite Patricia to talk about the book. Thank you very much, Anne. And thank you to Charlotte and Tracy for your words. Um, it gives me great pleasure and honor to have two scholars of, of your standing talking about my work and attending this launch. So thank you very much to both of you and thank you for your support along the way. Um, it was scary to be reminded of how long this journey has taken, but interestingly also aligns with what I would like to share with you today. So I'm just gonna share my screen. So Black Mothers and Attachment Parenting owes a great debt to the scholarship of, on parenting culture, Black motherhood, and Black feminist theory, and on attachment parenting, which both Charlotte and Tracy and Anne are responsible for developing. So thank you all very much to all three of you for your work and for being here. I also want to thank the Thomas Coram Research Unit for hosting this launch and for hosting my current work, which as Charlotte described, Charlotte Anne Anne described is focused on parental leave. I'm really grateful for this opportunity and I want to take time to reflect on the key themes of the book and on the experience of writing it, especially in these last 12 months. So as 
Charlotte already hinted at, the first seeds of this book were planted back in late 2004, early 2005 in South Africa. I was 17 and I watched my older sister prepare for the birth of her first child, my gorgeous nephew, Luca. I followed her, as younger sisters are wont to do, into the online manifestation of parenting culture, where mothers, and I want to be specific here, it was mothers who were directed to follow a dizzying array of often contradictory advice about how to care for their children, what to eat during pregnancy, how many ultrasounds to have, where to give birth, and perhaps most volatile of all, how to feed their baby. The internet also exposed my sister and I to the phenomenon of attachment parenting, or AP. Although we'd both grown up seeing babies carried in wraps on mother's backs and shared beds with little cousins that we were babysitting, the philosophy as described by William Sears, uh, an American pediatrician, and by his wife Martha, who's a registered nurse, was new to us. And yet the Sears claimed that this instinctive and ancestral practice of attachment parenting was famous around the world, around many cultures, particularly naming Africans as natural practitioners of AP. I struggled to reconcile this vision of African attachment parents with the image of AP I saw online and the socioeconomic constraints faced by the average South African woman, whom I knew would rarely be able to afford to take two to three years away from paid work to care for children in the ideal attached manner that the Sears promoted. In the context of Anglophone countries like the US, UK and Canada, the contradiction between the idealized African attachment parenting mother and the stereotype of black motherhood that Tracy so well described, so pervasive in these countries, seemed especially stark and is what motivated this project. Between 2015 and 2016, I interviewed 19 black mothers living in Britain and Canada. These two countries were particularly interesting to me because they share some noteworthy similarities, including the sizes of their black populations and histories of Caribbean and African migration. But also because much of the scholarship that I was drawing on, on attachment parenting, intensive mothering and black feminist theory tended to originate in the US. So this was an opportunity to offer a nuanced analysis of how the intersection between race, class, and gender manifests in different countries, histories, policies, and in the everyday experience of parents who live in these two countries. During my time in the UK and Canada, I visited women in their homes and workplaces. I held babies and played with toddlers. I watched as the mothers breastfed, disciplined, and interacted with their children who ranged in age from a newborn to a 12 year old budding entrepreneur. I deliberately aimed to speak to a wide range of mothers, particularly those who were enthusiastic about attachment parenting and those who were more suspicious of it and those in between. This allowed me to develop what I hope is a nuanced analysis of attachment parenting that acknowledges both the way it reflects and perpetuates dominant ideas about ideal parenting and heightens individual responsibility for children's outcomes and the potential it might offer to black mothers to resist stereotypical representations of them as neglectful and burdensome. Treading this line between these two depictions of attachment parenting has been difficult. Throughout data collection, analysis, and the writing and publication of this book, I've been concerned about how the mothers themselves might receive my analyses. I've been thinking a lot about the power inherent to my position. Representing interview participants' words in a publication that they're likely to see but might not be able to afford, and how they might feel about how they've been represented. To riff off of Anne Oakley, the women I spoke to gave me the gift of their time, and for the committed attachment parents among them, the gift of their enthusiasm and passion for the philosophy. They wanted me to succeed as a fellow Black woman, as an academic, and as they hoped, a promoter of AP and what it could do for the Black community. As Anne Oakley points out, however, giving is not conditional on the uses that the receiver makes of the gift. But I don't want to use this as an excuse to misrepresent the stories that the women shared with me or to suggest that the interpretations that I present in the book are infallible. 
I wish to own them. This is my story of their stories. This question of representation is integral to the black feminism that I try to develop throughout the book and in my current work. This black feminism gives prominence to lived experience, but sees that experience as the starting point. This might best be demonstrated in the question that has come up a number of times since I have been, began working on this project, most recently as I was finalizing the revision. I've been asked, is this a book about attachment parenting or is it a book about black motherhood? And I want to take this opportunity to say definitively, this book is about both. It is about situating attachment parenting, attachment parenting in a long history of parenting culture that has consistently identified mothers as uniquely responsible and capable of raising children well, as long as they adhere to expert advice. A contextualization that is made possible by examining attachment parenting from the perspective of black mothers who are often imagined as incapable of good parenting. The two ideas are inseparable and are only made the more significant by attending to the women's own use of attachment parenting as a tool to find community in white dominated neighborhoods, as a strategy to connect to a wider black diaspora, even if homogenized and imagined, as a buttress against their exclusion from good motherhood. The book attempts to capture these complexities by focusing on some of the key tools associated with attachment parenting and with good parenting more generally, infant feeding, sleeping and carrying, as well as the ever controversial task of balancing work and family. The book does not shy away from pointing out the often overlooked racial politics that underlie the promotion of attachment parenting and intensive mothering more broadly and offers what I hope is an intersectional analysis that attends to the intersection of racism, sexism, and neoliberal capitalism in the making of contemporary parenting culture. Attention to this precise intersection has only been heightened in the last 12 months. As we navigate COVID-19, renewed calls that Black Lives Matter, and an increasing acknowledgement that our society is organized in a way that does not serve the vast majority of people, as I revised this book and read through proof after proof, I was struck by how much has changed and how much has not changed. We are living through the novel coronavirus pandemic and there seems to be recognition that racism is, itself is a pandemic. I wondered whether it was still appropriate to describe the UK and Canada as post-racial as I do in the third chapter of the book. I discussed their status as countries where race and racism is framed as a problem of the past an obstacle already overcome or hardly mattering in the great story of British and Canadian nationhood. I wondered if I ought to have updated my references. Seeing David Cameron's name felt particularly jarring given the numerous and dramatic changes in the premiership that we've seen over the last five years. But as I recalled attending a Black Lives Matter protest this summer, I also felt, felt like things hadn't changed that much at all. Claims of superior British values and Canadians posturing against the intolerance of neighbors to the South abound. The pandemic also seems to have renewed and reinvigorated the ideological aspects of neoliberalism that I attend to in the book, with extra pressure to look after yourself, take responsibility, stay alert to the virus, with blame poised to be directed at anyone but the state for years of underfunding healthcare systems or failing to raise statutory sick pay to livable wages. It also demonstrates the way we continue to center the economy, even as we face this massive public health crisis. Ongoing debates that frame economics in competition with public health are an excellent example of the ways in which economic growth is prized above all else. At one point, the wider public has been implored to eat out to help out, return to COVID secure workplaces, and send their children to school to play in bubbles because a healthy economy is required for the maintenance of public health. The mystique of anti-racism I describe in the book has reared its head again in the wake of the reignition of Black Lives Matter protests in the US that have spread globally, including to the UK. One of the rallying cries of the protests in Britain was that the UK is not innocent, a statement that directly challenges the way that Britain positions itself as free of institutional and systemic racism. Similarly, in Canada, Royal Canadian Mounted Police Commissioner Brenda Lucky expressed confusion about the definition of systemic racism and questioned whether it existed in the Canadian police force. The post-racial in Britain now appears to, to be manifesting in the collapsing of black and minority ethnic people's experiences into a monolith 
to enable claims such as Health Secretary Matt Hancock's assertion that Boris Johnson's 2020 cabinet is one of the most diverse in British history. It also appears in the resurgence of biological definitions of race that serve to explain higher rates of COVID infection, severity and death among racialized populations, rather than the systemic racism that means that people of color in the UK are more likely to live in deprived areas, in overcrowded accommodation and experience discrimination in health access and services. Most strikingly, the post-racial now appears in the responses of various corporations and institutions to that newfound acceptance that Black Lives Matter. There's been an overwhelming focus on unconscious bias, debates over statues, and initiatives to spark individual change rather than addressing structural racism. My gorgeous nephew turns 16 next month. In the decade and a half that has passed since that first inspiration, I am struck by the persistence of these ideas about racism, a culture that favors economics and how this impacts ideal parenting, but also by our ever creative resistance to these pressures. And it is in this context and in this spirit that I release the book into the world. I hope I have made my participants proud and I hope that I have demonstrated the unique and integral role that race critical analyses play in our understanding of contemporary parenting culture and the policies that it produces, a focus that I hope to take up in my current project on parental leave. Thank you everyone for coming and I look forward to your questions, comments and feedback. Thanks very much.